Welcome to Sleepover Cinema, where we analyze the films that created the collective unconscious of those who saw Barbie on opening day. I'm Hannah Leach, a writer, musician, audio producer, and wearer of pink all year round. And I'm Audrey Leach, director, editor, producer, and extremely jealous of Barbie's pool. We are the sister duo, also known as Two Pink Productions, and we haven't stopped thinking about these movies since we first saw them, which was extremely recently. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> We're going to explore the good, the bad, and the nonsensical of the movies that inspire our love for film in an attempt to answer the question, are these movies actually good? And at the end of the day, do we really care if they are? Today we are talking about 2023's Barbie. When my heart breaks. Some things have been happening that might be related. When my world shakes. Cold shower. Ooh. Falling off my roof. Ah! And my heels are on the ground. <gasps> what do I have to do? You have to go to the real world. You can go back to your regular life, or you can know the truth about the universe. The choice is now yours. The first one, the high heel. You have to want to know, okay? Do it again. Closer, I am found. I'm coming with you. Okay. Wow, this is the real world. <laughs> What's going on? Why are these men looking at me? Yeah, they're also staring at me. Barbie in the real world. That's impossible. If this got out, this could mean extremely weird things for our world. This would be catastrophic! We haven't played with Barbie since we were like five years old. Oh. No one rests until this doll is back in a box. Even if nobody else sings along. Humans only have one ending. Get that Barbie! Ideas live forever. No, I won't let you do just one appendectomy. But I'm a man. But not a doctor. Can I talk to a doctor? You are talking to a doctor. I need a clicky pen? No. A sharp thing? No. There he is. Doctor! Somebody get security. Is Bobby booted if you still in doubt? Sleepover cinema girlies, you know this is the first new release we have ever done in all ever. eight seasons of Sleepover. Ever. It had to be for yeah. something that people cared about this much. The amount of enthusiasm, pink, and costumes that I have seen around New York City over the past five days is truly awe-inspiring. It is hard it is. to get people to care about anything in today's day and age enough to like put something specific on and go to a place at a certain time. Like yeah. that is, it's a tall order for people nowadays. I forget who I was talking to, but I was saying how I haven't experienced hype for a movie like this since like Harry Potter movies. Yeah. Like it, this is so juicy and cute and exciting and people in pink earnestly. I have I have on one shirt that's pink that like is the one that I had, but I went to a Barbie party the other night and I had to go like procure something because yeah, it just wasn't cutting it. If you're watching the video, you're probably like, are you just not going to acknowledge the fact? <laughs> <laughs> I have on a very long blonde wig. If you want to see that, you got to go to the video version. <laughs> yeah, Audrey has found a new pocket of herself with this wig. She's loving the wig. I was just saying, Hannah, it wouldn't even matter what color it is. I just, it was always my dream to have like waist length hair that stopped evenly because I have curly hair. So that's just not a possibility really. Yeah, yeah. So I enjoy that. Somebody at the Barbie party I was at thought this was my actual hair. And it was a girl, a girl who was blonde. And oh I was God. like, it wasn't like a, some guy or something who like can't spot it. I was like, yeah. wow. You're more blonde than I am today because my roots are heinously grown out right now. We also need to 
declare that today's a first and a last because it's our first current day movie, but the last time that each of us are recording episodes in our respective homes, which is yep. nuts. Yep, and I already dismantled my room, so this is a very makeshift situation, but it <laughs> looks good. So It looks I'm good, happy with yeah. It. In lieu of the question for the culture this week, we have our beloved friends from Regal back, because of course, this movie just came out. You should be using your Regal Unlimited subscription to go see Barbie, especially if you saw Barbie and Oppenheimer at the same time. There was an opportunity. There's still an opportunity to get a lot of bang for your buck out of that situation. So here's our little conversation with one of our friends from Regal. Okay, everyone, we are here with Micah from Regal. She is the social media coordinator for Regal. We're just going to talk Barbie for a while because how can we not with this episode on Barbie? Micah, you were talking about before we got on the recording, just how much you were enjoying watching people walk around in costume at theaters. Yes, I love themes dress up days because it's Barbie and Oppenheimer and so many people made it an all day thing. Such a fun side because I hardly ever see so many people wearing pink. I found a hot pink top and I tracked down a trench coat. And this is in the middle Ooh. of July in Tennessee. <laughs> Femininity, girliness seems to be back in. I was very much a tomboy growing up. Mm. And there mm. were so many things, you know, all the little boys would say, well, that's for girls. That's not cool. It's completely flipped now that I'm an adult. This is the year of the woman, the forever of the woman. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for this. <laughs> Did you grow up with siblings? Yes. So I have an older brother. So does that mean that you didn't play with Barbie back in the day? I was a Bratz girl. Oh, okay. You know okay. what? Valid. Yeah, extremely <laughs> valid. We are very much hybrid Bratz and Barbie girls. Did you have a weird Barbie? We did, for sure. Wait, when you think of weird Barbie, Audrey, do you have like a specific one that comes to mind? No, because they were like all weird. Once we had Bratz dolls, the Barbies became, like, weird, I feel like. I guess. I think even more than that, we made our Kens be weird. Really? Yes. How so? The way we would play with them, like, the characterization of the Ken dolls was, was weird. Like, very yeah. odd. Okay, yeah. I can get that. Besides the newest movie, what is the best Barbie movie? Princess and the Popper. Let's just yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which edition was your favorite Barbie? Something that we always really treasured as kids was the special edition Barbie ornaments every year. We did it for a long time, and our mom is finally like, "Okay, we're done with." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, because we used to get a new one every year. And then maybe like five years ago, six years ago, she was like, that's quite enough because we're we're old. So what I'm hearing is you are going to have a Barbie <laughs> tree this year. Here's the thing, though. Our mom has custody of these ornaments. Yeah. Like and every year we would do like a draft of all of the Barbies <laughs> and we'd like go one by one picking our favorites because you always wanted to hang your favorites. Right. So yeah. we did a draft and now I feel like if we ever split them up, we'd have to do a draft again. I would rather one of us have all of them than yeah. split them. Or we could trade them back Honestly. and forth every Christmas. That could be cute. Yeah. Sisterhood of traveling Barbie ornaments. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There exactly. Go. That's a that's a good solution. Honestly. Yeah. Wow. We've really we've really done some. <laughs> <laughs> we this is family therapy. It turns out. <laughs> I feel like that happens a lot when I talk to people. I saw Barbie at Regal. As I told you earlier, I've already seen it twice. Three weeks of Barbie releasing. I'm probably gonna watch it three times. Also, I need to make time for Talk To Me and Haunted Mansion. I need more hours in the day for all these movies. <laughs> yeah. I saw Barbie alone with my popcorn and an IPA, and it was a beautiful <laughs> experience. That sounds amazing. Micah, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you join us today. We hope you're enjoying Barbie season because we definitely are. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me and especially on the Barbie episode. Okay, so shall we? Yeah. Audrey and I have 
only shared with each other the bare, 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 bare minimum of our opinions on the movie to each other. So this is going to be a juicy discussion. Barbie was released July 21st, 2023, and it's rated PG-13. The synopses from all these different places. IMDb says, Barbie suffers a crisis that leads her to question her world and her existence. Letterboxd says, Barbie and Ken are having the time of their lives in the colorful and seemingly perfect world of Barbie land. However, when they get a chance to go to the real world, they soon discover the joys and perils of living among humans. And then Rotten Tomatoes. To live in Barbie land is to be a perfect being in a perfect place, unless you have a full on existential crisis or you're a Ken. The tagline is, she's everything, he's just Ken. And... I like that tagline. I think as a tagline, it's very intriguing. Like when I saw it recently for the first time, I was like, now what does that, like I get it on a surface level what that means, but without knowing like what's in the movie, it may, yeah. it, you know, like there's more to understand about it once you've seen the movie. So I feel like that yeah. is a good tagline for that reason. Audrey, do you want to tell us about the creative team behind this movie? Sure. So directed by Greta Gerwig, Need I Say More, Lady Bird, Little (laughs) Women, Mistress America, Frances Ha. She's known for writing with her husband, Noah Baumbach. Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach have worked on a lot of films together. Marriage Story, Frances Ha, White Noise, The Squid and the Whale. Sometimes it's just Noah's film, sometimes it's just Greta's film, but they also write together. I do admire their writing relationship. Sometimes I've wondered, like, what does that actually mean? Because... Writing it can be a very solo sport, usually. Yes. But what it meant for Francis Ha was more so that they, like, shared a vision of what the film would be ultimately and would just send each other scenes back and forth. Like, they would just kind of write these moments. It started from Greta, though. She was like, I, this is what I kind of want it to be. This is, like, a huge list of, like, scenes that I've thought of, but it has no order or anything. And then they would just kind of work off of that and send each other scenes. So, like, I feel like that's a really cool way to write. It's important to note that Margot Robbie is actually the one who started this whole project. She was the one who was like, I want to make the Barbie movie. She was the one who wanted Greta to direct it. She was the one who wanted Greta to write it. And so ever since she had seen Lady Bird and other things Greta had done, she had always wanted to work with her, but the opportunity never came. And then finally, when she was done with Little Women, it was like time to propose this whole thing. And Greta was down. And so that's how it all kind of came about. This wasn't like a Greta Gerwig brainchild. It wasn't really hers in the way that most of her films are. So that I feel like that's something we'll talk about later. And then I thought that we just have to mention Mark Ronson for producing the music and kind of being the musical visionary behind the movie because the music is very memorable. So for those who don't know who he is, he's a British American music producer, DJ, songwriter, record executive. You've definitely heard his music before. He's best known for collaborations with Amy Winehouse, Lady Gaga, Adele, Lily Allen, Duran Duran, Robbie Williams, Miley Cyrus, Queens of the Stone Age, and Bruno Mars. So like Uptown Funk, etc. Rehab. He's winning Grammys for those songs. Producer of the year. He was like the person, the producer behind Back to Black, Amy Winehouse's Grammy winning album. You gotta mention Dua Lipa Future Nostalgia. That's all him too. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that too. Which makes sense because he produced the Dua Lipa song for this. Yes. They're they're a very movie. known duo at this point, those two. And just movie-wise, he received an Academy Award, a Golden Globe, and a Grammy Award for co-writing the song Shallow for A Star Is Born. So he was up in that as well. Okay, cast. So, of course, Margot Robbie is stereotypical Barbie. She's the regular Barbie. She's known for Wolf of Wall Street, Suicide Squad, I, Tanya, Bombshell, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and The Big Short. Ryan Gosling is known for La La Land, Blue Valentine, The Notebook, Drive. A lot of people love this film he's in called Nice Guys. And also just for being like a child actor um, Mm -hmm. and like very uh, extroverted, let's say. Like there's just a lot of 
clips of him dancing as a child. And this, the cast otherwise, though, is like a million people. Issa Rae, Kate McKinnon, Hari Neff, Alexandra Ship, Anna Cruz Kane, Dua Lipa, many, 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 many more. Um, John Cena is in it for some reason, you know. Yeah. Just tons of people. America Ferreira as Gloria. Of course, a staple to sleepover cinema in general. Sisterhood mm-hmm. of the Traveling Pants, Ugly Betty, How to Train Your Dragon. <laughs> Apparently, um, she's like known for that. Will Farrell as the CEO. This is where my friend Nikta comes in because she works for his production company. And so mm-hmm. that's kind of how she got involved with this movie, which is cool. Uh, that one guy from Fleabag with <laughs> bad teeth. True. Yeah. Um, Michael Sarah as Alan, who is like the discontinued boy doll in the Barbie franchise. There are a ton of people in this movie. (laughs) Like, a ton. Yeah. We forgot to say so many important people. It's not even funny. Emma Mackey, Simu Liu, and Ariana Greenblatt as Gloria's daughter. Also, Rhea Perlman, who is Mrs. Wormwood in Matilda, cannot forget about her. Sharon Rooney. And then we've also got Emerald Fennel, who some of you may know directed Promising Young Woman. Truly, the list goes on. Helen Mirren. Okay, okay, I think I got all the big ones. Okay, so in terms of the dollars, so we're recording this episode on Monday, July 24th. The numbers have surely grown since this moment. The budget for this movie was $145 million. That's not including the marketing, which obviously is tremendous in so many ways. But Audrey told me a fun fact about the success of this movie so far. Barbie has already surpassed the record for highest opening weekend numbers for a female director ever. It's crazy. It's really, really, yeah. really crazy. And I am very pleased in general that it is happening. So the movie's only been out right now for three days and the worldwide gross is currently $337 million. So, and it's just going to grow from there. <laughs> It's heightening every second, literally. Yes. Several hundred thousand dollars added to this number by the time we're done recording, probably. But I did read that, like, when Margot was trying to pitch production companies to, like, do it, she was like, this movie will make a billion. She was, like, just, she was just, like, saying that, like, not really knowing, obviously. And it's probably going to happen. It's definitely going to happen, all things considered. Going into critic and audience opinions... It's very fresh. The critic score on Rotten Tomatoes for Barbie is 90%. And the critic consensus so far is Barbie is a visually dazzling comedy whose meta humor is smartly complemented by subversive storytelling. And then as for critic opinions, there was like a review roundup in the New York Times called Barbie Reviews Are In, Slickly Subversive or Inescapably Corporate. The New York Times basically compiled some chunks from all major outlets reviews of Barbie. And so I just picked a few that I thought were interesting. So David Fear of Rolling Stone said... This is a saga of self-realization filtered through both the spirit of free play and the sense that it's not all fun and games in the real world. A doll's story that continually drifts into the territory of a doll's house. So extra. This is a movie that wants to have its dream house and burn it down to the ground too. Then we have Manola Dargis, chief critic for the New York Times. While Gerwig does slip in a few glints of critique, as when a teenage girl accuses Barbie of promoting consumerism, shortly before she pals up with our heroine, these feel more like mere winks at the adults in the audience more than anything else. And then lastly, Justin Chang of the LA Times. Gerwig has conceived Barbie as a bubblegum emulsion of silliness and sophistication, a picture that both promotes and deconstructs its own brand. It doesn't just mean to renew the endless Barbie good or bad debate. It wants to enact that debate, to vigorously argue both positions for the better part of two fast-moving, furiously multitasking hours. Furiously multitasking is correct. (laughs) Yes. I just looked at Common Sense Media's rating, like age rating, because I was talking with an adult recently that was like, could you bring a kid to see this? Oh, it was when I was getting 
uh, I got a pedicure on Friday and all of the ladies in the salon were dressed up in pink and they had like a Barbie themed cocktail in the salon and stuff. And the lady who was doing my nails asked me if a kid could see it. And I was like, probably there's nothing like. No, egregious. definitely. The idea yeah. is that kids can see it because that's a huge yeah. profit. Um, right. And Mattel also would never let it be made without <laughs> without kids being able to see it. Yeah. That, that's just an important aspect that we also didn't, like, talking about production companies is kind of important here. Like, this is a Mattel yeah. product. This is yeah. not an unauthorized rusical, if you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such a great way to put it. <laughs> Even though it's rated PG-13, Common Sense Media said it's appropriate for ages 11 and up, which seems even a little conservative. Well, it's the kind of thing where it's like, are you okay with your kids hearing the word vagina? Like, it's that yeah. kind of thing. Going into audience score and letterboxed average star rating. So the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes is 90%, and the average star rating as of yesterday was 4.2 stars. So here are a few audience opinions. These are all from Rotten Tomatoes. Four stars. Loved all the Barbies and Kens. Alan is hilarious. A little deep at the end, but very cute. Probably better with Cosmos. Drinks clinking emoji. Love that review. I mean, I agree with that statement. I should have been yeah. drunk. Next review. Five stars. I was expecting a funny beachy girly movie and instead got the heart shattering story about girlhood. Never felt more seen. We're going to return to that concept. I This is all typos. One star. I don't like this movie. They're trying to Brian wash us. I hate movies like this. I definitely won't be watching these types of movies anymore. I should have watched Freedom Movie next time. I don't know what that means. And then one star. This is further proof of the disintegration of American intelligence. The only reason people went was because of the PR effort and the brainwashed masses. Not Brian washed this time, but brainwashed masses. Sorry to say I was one. Please do not spend money on this horrible fiasco. Cultural context. We don't even really need to give it because you girlies are in it. We're all in it right now. Context is look around wherever you are in the world right now. Really yeah. feel that. Think about it. Take it in. Think about the state of the economy and the globe. And and, and that's the marketplace. That, that's what we're talking about. It's yeah. really hitting right now. Before we talk about our opinions about the movie, we should talk about perhaps our own associations with barbie because everyone has their own associations with barbie yeah and i mean we have a ton earlier i was editing a different episode and i was rummaging through some home video stuff as i tend to do and i yes. just so happened to roll up on this one moment which was it was an easter and i think i'm like two maybe in the clip and my dad goes I'll just I'll just place it in here. But the point is, I found a clip of me being very excited to have received a new Barbie. And it was a Cinderella <laughs> Barbie. Literally three seconds after the box enters my hands, you go, can I play with it too? <laughs> Who is that? All right. No Cinderella. A Cinderella doll. Can I play with that too? Sure, you guys can share. And I'm like, I'm can so you not let? Can you not let me have this for five seconds? Like, <laughs> of course I couldn't. And my and then Dad's like, yeah, you can share. And I'm just like holding the thing. I'm just like, I mean, I'm too young to like have a rebuttal, yeah. but like, I didn't stand a chance. I'm sorry, I, I really didn't. <laughs> I'm so um, sorry. <laughs> Being nonverbal can really fuck that up. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. And then also that reminded me of a different moment that was also recorded on a Christmas morning where we're like standing there in our little robes and uh -huh. my da oh, and yeah. dad's like, are you excited? And then you go like, we're about to get a bunch of toys or something. And then I'm like, he, 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 Barbie. <laughs> and it's like. <laughs> about a bunch of toys. <laughs> Barbie. <laughs> Barbie. <laughs> she named me Barbie. I remember any time that we ever got presents for anything, like if you saw 
like a that 14 shape. inch by five inch box, your heart was racing. Who was going to be inside? You never knew. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know what's actually extremely relevant to this is the Mermaid Barbie story. There was this Mermaid Barbie that came out in like... It was so good. It had to have been 2004 or three around there. And you guys, I'm sure that some of you had this Barbie. She was really, really pretty. And she had this tail with these little like thingies on the side where if you put her tail underwater, it would glow. There's a magic lagoon where you will see me. This Barbie was like everything I ever would have wanted in a Barbie. And Audrey got it for Christmas and our cousin Aaron got it for Christmas and I didn't get it. And I was so jealous and so salty and I didn't actually really do anything. I don't think, but basically mom was really inspired by the dynamic. And she made this like draft of a children's book where the plot of the story was about like a little girl having to like learn to be a bigger person and like not be so jealous of the mermaid Barbie. But it's so funny because now I'm almost 28 and I have like a giant mermaid tattoo on my leg that actually looks a lot like that Barbie. Yeah. I didn't put that together until right now, but it totally looks like her. Loved Jam and Glam Barbie. I think she was my favorite ever. She had a scalp that you could twist. And when you twisted it, she had like blunt bangs and white blonde hair. And then when you twisted it, it was hot pink blunt bangs and long hair. She had shiny silver flare pants, a chevron crop top that was purple and pink, and then a hot pink fur stole little jacket thing. But what's funny about that is that when no matter which way you have the hair on, there's blunt bangs at the bottom of her scalp. (laughs) She has like a weird little undercut. Yeah, it's funny. Another thing with Barbies that is kind of funny is that at some point we sort of switch sides to brats that, uh, that's like a yes. big a big topic amongst doll owners i guess um yeah and within the world of videos that we made with our brats dolls and with our cousins <laughs> the barbies became like they would there were some barbies in that world Yeah, there were some Barbies in the world of Gaylord, but, like, all of the Barbies were, like, the narcs or, like, the old people. Like, they were never, like, the main characters, except for we had this one character. What did we name him? Mr. Wardrobe. (laughs) Right, Mr. Wardrobe. The best thing about Mr. Wardrobe is that we decided that he was going to be... He was like Gaylord's long-lost father who also was gay. Yeah. I cannot emphasize enough how much we were making, like, gay... Like, weird, like, gay father-son content when we we were, were, like, 11 and 9. Like... Yeah. So young doing this, but the point is that I covered Mr. Wardrobe. He was a Ken doll, and I drew tattoos all over him. So he has like bear paws on his pecs and like a snake on his arm and all this absurd shit. And he was a star. But if there were any like basic girl Barbies, they would just be like insane or yes, weird. Another thing that feels really relevant to that whole conversation. I feel like I may have talked about this before, but our listener, Joey, recommended that I read this book called You Don't Own Me. And it's about the beef between MGA and Mattel and like the Barbie versus Bratz like IP battle. And it was a very interesting like text to have read seeing the Barbie movie. But if you're interested in like marketing, corporate drama or dolls or gays, you should... (laughs) read this book and the audiobook is really well narrated so yeah i mean but the barbie mems go on and on and on and on but maybe we should i don't know if we could leave it for the second half but like did you have an easy time like projecting play onto barbies or was it you know like 
were you ever comparing yourself to a Barbie or was it just, this is my doll? It was definitely, as far as I can recall, this is my doll. Like, I don't think Me I was too. ever like, I feel like in terms of like body image stuff, you wouldn't compare yourself to a fucking doll. You'd compare yourself to like a real girl on TV or something. Yeah. And also Barbie's a woman. Like she's grown. Like I would not yeah. have thought that I should look like her at my age, like when I was playing with yeah. her. So, yeah. and in fact, I don't think I really cared about that or even wanted to. So I don't think yeah. that was a big issue. To me, it was way more like, look at their outfits, look how pretty they are, like look at their hair. It was very much like these are little beautiful fashion creatures more than yeah. this is what I'm supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. And I think we had even more passion towards Barbies portraying another character. So like the Disney princess Barbies, yes. like it, it was more like we weren't huge, just Barbie period people. It was like Barbie as blank. Also, yes. of course, all the Barbie movies that we've covered, like we were into those yeah. for sure. A few more Barbie items I just thought of the CD ROMs. Barbie Pet yes. Rescue, Barbie yes. Manicures or whatever that was called. Yeah, Barbie Figure Skating, Barbie... Sparkling uh, Ice Show. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, the computer... Or the, the, like... Princess Bride. Yes. Oh, we gotta That's, throw that song in there. There's this one... Oh, yes. So there's this game. I'm sure some of you guys had it. It was Barbie as the Princess Bride, and it was like a point-and-click game, and it was so much fun. There was like a wedding. So the whole thing is that you're preparing for your wedding, which is really funny. And it's like oh, there's like a wedding cake decorating part. There's a wedding dress decorating part. Those were my favorite parts. And basically, you navigated all these different like mini games until you got to the end. But the second to last mini game was just a music video that you just had to sit there and watch. That was like a mid '90s <laughs> power ballad from the point of view of Barbie singing about wanting her prince to come home. And the other week, Audrey and I and our parents were in Debella's. If you if you're from Ohio, and we were like, we gotta, somehow it came into our heads that that song existed and we listened to it in Debella's and it was exactly what I hoped it would be. And I just can't wait to see my true love. If only I could truly see his face in the mirror. Still I can't believe that love has come and walked into our lives for all time. I'm going to ask on the story if you played that game, so please just yes. engage with that content because... Yes, please. It was a very potent Barbie game, if not the most. The Sleeping Beauty one was also pretty potent. But that wasn't Barbie, was it? It was. Really? Yep. Okay, so you know, that's very interesting to think about. The, the, the crossover there, like, how... Because it's not Disney... Right? Yeah. Yeah, because they're like fables. So I don't yeah. think you can really do that. And like visually, it looked really different. Like she was white and blonde, but other than that. It was fierce. Like it was like fiercer than Disney almost. Like in oh, terms of sure. the visuals. Remember when she was like laying in the bed and like the yeah. roses grew up around it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Disney, take notes on that one. We could yeah. really keep talking about Barbie media like forever, <laughs> but we have a big piece of Barbie media to discuss still perhaps the piece of the Barbie most. media right yes so perhaps you should head out to your closest regal cinema and go see barbie again audrey and i have not talked about our opinions really with each other yet not at all subtextually i feel as though i know what's coming but i am very interested to talk about it so we will be back shortly. So if you're a loyal listener of Sleepover Cinema, you have definitely heard me talk a lot about seeing movies in theaters because it's really important. It's important to not just sit at home and watch new movies on a TV. That's not cinema. That's not what Sleepover Cinema is about. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I've been around the block. I've tried all the other chains and all their <laughs> their unlimited programs. <laughs> and guess what? Regal Unlimited is where it's at. Regal Unlimited is the all you can watch movie subscription pass that pays for itself in just two visits. It can be a motivator to go to the movies if you mm-hmm. don't normally go. Mm-hmm. But for someone like me, it's like obvious. It's right. like, duh. And with Regal Unlimited, you can see any standard 2D movie anytime with no blackout dates or restrictions. So you don't have to like only go on Tuesdays before 2 p.m. You can go at prime time movie watching time if you want to. When you want to watch a movie in a premium format like 40X, IMAX, RPX, or ScreenX, your Regal Unlimited membership gets you into those premium experiences at a reduced cost. And I personally have experience of going to a 4DX screening of Harry Potter, and it was thrilling. I mean, you are, you are feeling the wind, you are feeling the water, you are being moved around. So I highly recommend that. You're not just getting a discount on your thrilling experience, but on snacks. And let me tell you, every single time I go to the movie theater, I could have $5 left in my bank account, but I... I am going to get popcorn and an an icy. Yeah. Like, it's so wrong to go and not get those items. (laughs) So, listen, it's just another reason. So, if you're planning on seeing two movies this month, which, how could you not? You need to join Regal Unlimited. So, sign up now in the Regal app, if you want to be fancy, or on regmovies.com slash unlimited. That's R-E-G movies dot com slash unlimited. New subscribers can use code back to reg 23 for 10% off of Regal Unlimited for the first three months. That's B-A-C-K-2, like the number two, R-E-G-2-3. We're back and it's finally time for us to talk about MFing Barbie. We've been withholding opinions from each other. I would like to institute a group reapplying of lip gloss before we do this. Thank you very much. I just think that it's important. It's very important culturally to this moment. Uh Uh-huh. And I just so happen to own the perfect shade that I never wear in my normal life. I have like a perfect, I have one really bougie lipstick. It's Marc Jacobs, but I already packed it. So all I have is my Fenty Glow, but I love this and I've been buying it since 2018. Okay, so I want to get one thing clear and that is that I am happy this movie exists. I think there's some amazing, amazing, practical old Hollywood filmmaking going on. Greta's passion towards bringing an old Hollywood soundstage back to relevancy. Let's have a dream sequence within a dream sequence. Kind of, it just has that, that like um, singing in the rain feel, that West Side Story feel. Like you can totally tell where the inspirations lie. And I love that. Like that's my shit. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily hit the same, but I love that it's there because, and no one else is doing it. So I think that alone is a huge accomplishment To have people give you that much money to make something that everyone would say nobody wants to see. That's huge. And just know that with all the opinions that are going to be said, that that is kind of like the umbrella of this whole thing. I also want to add to that. I was extremely entertained the entire time. And also... We've already kind of spoken to this, but the fact that there was like a movie event for girls and gays that was so highly anticipated, that was so unabashedly girly girl, unironic, very genuine, to me demonstrates a little bit of like, I don't know, it's like a little beam of light in this world. Yeah. And is it nostalgia mining? Yes. In theory. Yeah. But in theory. In practice, it's really not. But also, I think that what I'm really trying to say me. is, what I was gonna say is, it actually it feels like refreshing. It doesn't feel like it's rehashing anything old, actually. And it's 
attempting a new, a fresh take on an old concept, which doesn't in in itself make me mad. I also fully thought it was going to be life size and it wasn't. Well, I have a lot to say about life size, actually. I don't know when you want to get into like that and like how we should really open this up. But I was thinking about life size a lot after watching this movie. This is my bold claim. (laughs) Well, one of them. I I have bold claims also. I think that the emotional stakes and the story beats of life size make a lot more sense than the Barbie ones. You kind of understand like where the emotional stakes lie. And it's very easy with life size. Casey's mother is gone. She wishes she had her back. She gets this Barbie that she despises because (laughs) the new like, you know, her, her dad's like, low-key gf gives it to her the barbie ends up becoming her surrogate mother essentially (laughs) that is very easy to understand like you you understand why that would hit emotionally so that's just my thing with life size is like comparatively i think the heart of the movie comes across a lot more clearly whereas this movie is trying to accomplish a lot of things at once and that's really hard Mm -hmm. And I understand how it ended up that way because they do have a lot of things they want to talk about and they're all worthy subjects, which is capitalism, patriarchy, and kind of aging and beauty, I would say, are like the main yeah. the main three. The first like 15 minutes, really fun. And you're really kind of like, this is like lit. Like, I don't know where it's necessarily going, but I'm loving to see how this world works. It's very cute. It's beautiful. Yeah etc. Her feet flatten. You learn that the... Okay, at some point you're like, maybe I should just turn my brain off when I'm watching this because the internal logic maybe is not really just checking out that well. But you learn that Barbie loses herself when the person playing with her in the real world projects negative emotions onto the doll. And you, you learn that that is America Ferreira's character and not her daughter. Because her daughter doesn't care about Barbie. Okay? So that's like a lot. (laughs) That's like a lot on its own. But if we were going to spend two hours really kind of exploring this dynamic between the player and the playee, like the doll and the person who plays with the doll, and in this case, America Ferreira and Margot Robbie, if that was like where the emotional... uh, core lied if it became like sort of like a triangle between the mother the daughter and barbie i think that is exactly where we should have been i really thought that that's where it was gonna stop because not only did that just feel right but it's a greta gerwig movie Mm -hmm. and she loves a mother daughter woman thing and so i went and saw it with my mom and it was actually a face crack for a second because i was like yeah is this about to become like a mother daughter movie (laughs) Which, like, mom and I don't have beef, so, like, it would have been fine, but I was just like, oh, damn, is this I mean, you should have be? you should have gone in expecting that anyway. Like, ob- luckily, I mean, you know, it ended up not, it ended up not being yeah. that, and I think, to me, yeah. that is the biggest disappointment, the degree to which Ken hijacks this movie. I cannot believe it, honestly. Why is that fucking musical number in this movie? Well, here's the thing. I'm not mad at that musical number if we had a good equivalent. Like, I'm not right. mad at it at all. I think no. I think it's fun. I love that they did a double dream sequence. I love that there's choreo. I love all of that. Can I read something really quick? I, I saw this on somebody's Instagram story, and I was like, oh, T. But why is a film called Barbie somehow all about Ken? For a story about female empowerment, it is vexing that Ken's neediness, loneliness, and identity crisis hijack the plot for for long stretches and force Barbie to help him, not the reverse. It feels disrespectful that she is so subservient because the film emphasizes the message that Barbie the doll inspired legions of women to go, be, and do whatever they wanted because anything is possible. Barbie states its message often, but at times it feels more mechanical, like a doll talking, than motivational. I can totally understand getting swept up in the fun of this sort of, like, reversal of what you think it's going to be it is like a fun thought experiment but i think in the final draft it really should have been taken down i i can just yeah. i can see that like working with ryan gosling being really fun and him wanting to do a lot and him taking things to such a high level we got to remember what who this is for and what it's for like i think yeah. that 
Yeah. If this was like a rated R Barbie movie, I could see all this being there and like just taking everything to 100 in terms of like kind of like maybe raunchiness or like just like crassness. Because like, I I don't know, like it just it didn't feel amazing um, to watch the movie get hijacked when Barbie is given in the beginning a really good solid mission when Kate McKinnon pulls down that map thing and she's yeah. like this is what you have to do that is great in a, in a kids yeah. movie you know in general it's great for the audience to know what the mission is and are we going to accomplish it and this is in a, yeah. in a very literal sense she says are you choosing to go to the real world or are you choosing to stay yeah. here that's great and I was like, okay, sweet. We know where we're going. But then it immediately gets sidetracked by Ken being in the car in the first place um, to go to the real world. And as soon as they get there, it becomes immediately about Ken discovering what patriarchy is. Because I remember thinking, like, when they get to the real world and they, like, split up, I was like, okay... Barbie is going to have like 80% and he's going to have like a little comedic relief scene. Yeah. But then it ended up being more like 50 50 at best. And I was like, huh? And then it just got more and more heavy handed. And my thing is this. So a lot of people are like, this movie is anti man, which to me is kind of neither here nor there. I, I feel like ultimately in the end, it's actually really loving towards men. Exactly. Me too. Almost pro. (laughs) Right. Why does Barbie say you're beautiful to an old woman like 15 minutes in? Should that should that not have been the 75 percent of the way there moment? That should have been. Yeah. You know, she goes to the real world. She kind of seems like she already knows how how it works. Like she she's not doing the Tyra Banks like not knowing how to eat thing. Like like yeah the like deer in the headlights type of thing, which is kind of what's needed, but we don't understand if Barbie has been to the real world before. It seems like she has, doesn't it? It, Like, it feels like she's already been there and she kind of understands how it works. Yeah. It's obviously, like, pretty detached from reality in the first place. So, like, the fact that then they go to reality, I'm like, how much of reality is this reality? Because then you have the whole Will Ferrell CEO thing, which I'm very curious what you're going to say about that. It wasn't too, too bad. I think the chase scene didn't really do much for me. Um, I, I think that it didn't do much for me, honestly, overall. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't bad. Like I'm not I understand why it's in the movie. Um, but that in conjunction with the Rhea Perlman scenes had me really confused. It was whiplash. There was just it certain was moments where I was like, what are they getting at? Yeah. Well, because there were a couple moments that actually made me like feel pretty deeply same like a few the yeah like the first one was when she was like sitting on the bench before she told the old lady look and then the other when she was just looking at the humanity yeah yeah that that was good but i do think it was placed wrong in the movie it was a great scene but it was way too early um and then the part where it was like the flash the flashback of like or whatever the montage was of like all these women laughing and mm. like enjoying their lives over time oh my like God. that i really loved once i heard the background about it i was like oh that's sweet so like basically greta asked all the cast and crew if they had any women in their lives that were like special for blank reason and like did they have good footage stuff like that so so all the footage is of people relevant mm-hmm. to the film which helps me a lot because the reason it bothered me is because it reminded me a lot of 2019 Charlie's Angels that did a very similar thing it, it kind of bristles with me when there's like stock footage adjacent represent <laughs> like representations of underrepresented you know, not even underrepresented mm-hmm. but like yeah, yeah, yeah. groups do you know what i mean like yeah when like stock footage of gay people at in front of a flag like stock footage yeah. of women in the workplace like anything that kind of reminds me of that i really don't like because it's 
expecting you as the audience to like fill in blanks that like we mm-hmm. don't we shouldn't have to like what why can't we deal in the specifics of these characters and understand something about yeah. them rather than you know a global message that feels really impersonal actually the end of the movie or like when she's in the void with with Ruth Handler it was reminding me of like Harry Potter like Dumbledore yeah. and Harry Potter in the void when he's like you can go live or whatever except yeah. I mean it has a very similar purpose to that scene except I just don't know why Barbie would want to go live in the real world when she spent this entire movie in Barbie world trying to fix Barbie world like can't you so easily see her spending more time in the real world with this mother and daughter understanding more about their background and how she affected them like mm-hmm. that's what she needs to learn about she, that's what need that would that's what would change her perspective to say i actually want to be here because i understand the beauty of the like the beauty of the pain of what yeah. hu- humans go through and that it's like worth it but that's not what the movie's about and it, no. it i do feel like greta's greta's intentions got slowly over time shifted and shifted and shifted because I know that I've heard in interviews and stuff that trying to make this movie was like fighting a hundred battles at once like it was like very difficult (laughs) and it totally would be but you can see her you can see her filmmaking and her personality popping through at times but it's just it's really half-baked compared to her regular work and as somebody who's a huge fan of her it's just like a little sad but at the same time I'm so happy that she's able to direct a movie this big when a lot of people might pigeonhole her as that indie director it's just like when you are so used to feeling a lot when you watch her movies it's like this is just a different thing yeah to the point of that review you read where somebody said never felt more seen etc so i saw this tweet that kind of speaks to that somebody at zoe rose bryant said feel like all the complaints about barbie's feminism being basic ignore how her journey intentionally parallels a girl's growth from childhood to adolescence and her first awareness of social inequities because she's purposefully modeled after kids because she's a kid's toy. I don't think that this is intentional. Like, I don't... This take yeah. is, a, is a pretty good take, but I don't think that it is it that it was purposeful for the feminism, the base, quote, basic feminism to mirror that of a child's. I don't think that that is true. But I do think that is a good way to try to justify how basic the feminism Uh is. The argument could be made that, you know, for us who are pretty extremely well-versed in these types of conversations, maybe for a younger girl or people who are less familiar, hearing a speech that explicitly talks about the patriarchy, capitalism, (laughs) feminism could be touching for them to me i've heard it all a million times in every single way like i don't i don't want that in my storytelling i would rather have a story shown to me that that portrays those themes rather than yeah you can't be too fat but you can't be too skinny and we can't have cellulite we have to be perfect blah 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 like yeah the america for dated yeah, it, it feels it feels dated because we personally are past that. Our, there, I'm sure there are lots of people out there, there have to be, right, who are less exposed to this sort of talk and yeah. this can be, like, a good thing for them, right? Yeah, well, I mean, yes, but this is where it gets really complicated because it's like, okay, by even having a movie that talks about the patriarchy explicitly, Mattel is taking a political stance, yeah, which they and definitely taking, don't want to do. Well, they normally don't, yeah. but I think that they're finally at the point where they're like, we need to pick a side because everyone is at this stance where they're picking a side or at, at this position. And I'm kind of like, okay, well, the argument that can be made that's like, we're going to help educate people that don't know what this is. It's like, it. honestly, I kind of feel like what you just said, which is like, show me a story where these concepts are illustrated instead of just being preached. Yeah. Like... 
that would that would be better for everyone yeah that'd be better for everyone because you'd be like at the end of it you'd be like wow that hit me really hard and let me think about why well okay so that also reminds me because mom was really annoyed about this and other people have been annoyed about this that i've seen but like the moment where america frera is like why can't we have just an ordinary barbie there have been ordinary Barbies There's forever like at this billion. point. That's what stereotypical Barbie is. I don't know if... Because here's the thing. The the traits that she was saying are not traits that can be portrayed in a doll. Like, that's not a... Right. It, a doll can only be visual. There There is no yeah. doll that does okay. <laughs> There's yeah. no doll that just gets through the day. Like, I don't really know yeah. what she's talking about. I mean, well, it's also like you can project that onto a doll if you want. That's how it all works. But yeah. you're an adult. Yeah. You're not going to be playing with dolls. <laughs> I've got a new one for you. Trust and believe. I okay. got, I've, just, I've been screenshotting shit left and right. This is, this I'm was ready. from a TikTok. So obviously okay. not great. <laughs> Realizing that Ken isn't some funny little guy, but a metaphor for all the adorable boys we grew up with who suddenly turned into misogynistic, objectifying teenagers that we will forever miss deep inside while having to face the fact of them not even noticing it. This is a take that I have been seeing. Ken represents That's not even a point. It's like not, it's like not really relevant to the movie. But <laughs> no, it's just like... To me, that feels so irrelevant. Yeah, me too. But I just wanted to bring that up because that is something that yeah. I have been seeing. And I'm like, guys, like, where are you even getting that from? That feels like a point from a greater conversation that people have connected to this. And I don't think that yeah. that is actually a part of the conversation. But yeah. Also, let me just say that it, I don't know if it's just based off of like who I'm friends with, but like I have never experienced that one. So like I can't really speak to it. Wait, what do you mean? Like me have, you know, having some friends when you're little, like little little boy friends and then they grow up and become misogynist. Me neither. Like I don't really have that one, but I know obviously it to happens. Me, but <laughs> to me that seems like an apologist take of like girls with horrible straight boyfriends who like aren't out of it yet. It's like deep no. down he loves women. Like cer <laughs> certainly that does happen. Like this is a very yeah. that is a real concept, but like the feminine perspective of it is kind of it doesn't f sit right in my heart really. Like it's like yeah, I agree. like it, it's like don't mourn those people. Like low key, like don't mourn those people. They will happen, yeah. and yeah, that is sad. But like that was their choice. Like to a certain extent, that's their choice. Yeah, men are well, indoctrinated, but they also have a choice. That take is incredibly white. Yeah, so that white. is the whitest take. It's the whitest take ever, which also leads me to, and this might be kind of shit starting, but I don't really care. I mean, it's a um, white. It is a white feminism movie. It's, it is. Yeah, but. And we'll, we'll come back to that. But I saw this tweet that was like, I can't believe I'm bringing this up, but I'm going to. It was like, summer 2023 has been all about feminine joy between Barbie and the era's tour. Yeah, it's like, for who, bitch? For who? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like women across the board do obviously have a harder time in life and like experience things really differently from men and like... <laughs> no shit. As Lana would say, as Lana would say, I'm not not a feminist. Yeah. No, I'm just like, I feel like I've learned so much over this past year about the lives of non-white women and specifically black women through this other podcast that I produced where I like can't unsee it. And you know, and we haven't even really touched upon like the capitalism of it all, but yes. a, as in the real yeah. life capitalism of it all, like, right. Yeah. Like it's, it's extremely fraught. Like it, the, the. The intersection of all of the things that we've talked about, I mean, Barbie goes back to the, the 50s. Like, this is, like, yeah. deep-rooted stuff that they are trying to recontextualize. Somebody tweeted, so yeah, Barbie might be intro-feminism, but looking at the political climate of America right now, a lot of people need an intro to feminism. That is a good point, but I think when if we're going to talk about storytelling, 
there's a more effective way to do it and there's a less effective way to do it and show not tell is the standby so like yeah yeah, I think I think if if we need that then I guess but it's like I wish it wasn't there like I wish we didn't have to hear the words patriarchy and whatnot so this comes from an interview with Greta Gerwig The interviewer said, During Barbie, I found myself thinking about a moment in Little Women when Joe has an emotional outburst. That really famous scene that everybody loves. Women, they have souls and they have ambition as well as beauty. Did you think of these two films in close proximity? And this is what Greta said. Mm. Yes, definitely. In some ways, all the movies I've co-written, written, and directed are all talking to each other. It is almost a mystery to me when I'm in the middle of it. And then when I step back, I think, oh, you continue to be interested in women. This is something you're fascinated by. That ache of contradictions of never being able to totally bridge that gap between adulthood and childhood is present in this movie, too. It's this overflowing sense of joy. And then it's also, I can never get back there. I can totally see how that's her intention (laughs) and and it's and it is there but I think it's extremely lost if she was able to write this movie on her own with zero interference I just know it would be so different the takeaway especially when you see it the first time you're like Ken I I honestly would be less mad if they just full sended it like, if you, yeah. like, really made everyone think that it was about Barbie and had this marketing that was she's she's everything, he's just Ken, and then completely swapped, like, that they did, like, yeah. a trick, I, I would be less mad at that um, than what we got. Because what we got is trying to say she's everything, but really, it's about Ken. Initially, you're, like, kind of supposed to feel bad for him. Yeah. But knowing that the Barbie world exists as a reflection, a response to what the real world holds should defeat that sympathy. It's it's like yeah. This world exists so that little girls can believe things or, or you know, believe they can be anything and men are not centralized in that world and there's a reason for that. So, in terms of, like, the narrative, I don't... There's no reason to feel bad for Ken. He's not real. Yeah. I was also, like, do we really have to see Barbie Land be defiled like this? Yeah, I was like, this is this sucks. (laughs) Yeah, like, couldn't it just be, like, in the end, she comes to appreciate Barbie Land for the escapist fantasy that it is, and it's, like, she's almost opting out of knowing better In some, like, deep takeaway, that could be a white feminism take for sure. That would be be very deep. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, Because that's that's what Barbie does. I mean, that's what what Barbie is. She she is... Yeah. And over time, you know, they... I don't remember what year it was, maybe, like, 2015 or something, when they started adding black dolls, Asian dolls, Latina dolls, and of different sizes, too. And then it it gets to a point where... The brand has gotten so far from its original iteration that it kind of feels like a different thing, not for the worst, but um, watching the movie made me feel like there there's some Mattel people sitting at a desk that are like, we need to somehow try to represent what the brand is today in this movie that yeah. is framed and using the image of the white Barbie. So the reason that everyone's so dazzled and wants to go see this movie is because of extremely white Margot and Ryan and extremely shiny and just the most stereotypically beautiful you could possibly get. And and you cannot deny that that's a huge reason why the movie is doing so well. Because it feels yeah. to a lot of people like a return to something familiar. You know how people put old Hollywood movies on a pedestal it's like oh and all the actors are white and they're all thin and they're all very like gone with the wind and shit yeah Yeah. it's like and people especially white people just there's a lot of craft reasons to admire those films but like in terms of like (laughs) the general uh like setup of Hollywood at the time they're really nothing to admire. Like, it, there was nothing There was yeah. nothing good going on for humanity at large in those times. <laughs> in a way, 
okay, they're going to lure people in with that traditional image and then they're going to shatter their expectations with black Barbie and trans Barbie and plus size Barbie. The return to form comment is so real because that's how it's so... That's why it's making so much money. Yeah. Is because it's hitting all these different markets. Like, did you see that TikTok of the heat map of what movie was getting more money based off what state? No, I didn't. They're in. It's like almost, which is really surprising to me. It's almost like completely aligned with the electoral map yeah. with Republicans being Barbie. Oh, that's interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, Imagine their surprise. <laughs> well, that yeah, that's interesting. Cause, like, I feel like in our heads, we're like, oh, I don't really understand like who the audience for Oppenheimer is because... Christopher Nolan movies, that's just a whole other category to me. When you think of, like, the whole Barbenheimer thing, it's, like, the girls are way more likely to see both than the guys are. Yeah, and, like, I'm open to seeing Oppenheimer, but it's, like, I'm not, cl- I'm not like, dying to. Um, but yeah, yeah. Like, I probably will, because that's, that, that's me. Like, I'll be, like, oh, I know there's, like, an admirable craft aspect here. Maybe I should yeah. go see it. I loved Kate McKinnon in this movie. Yeah, she was good. She was giving me like bridesmaids level energy, like with the comedy style and just the commitment to it. She made me very happy in this movie. And like I said in the beginning, a lot of things to admire about it craft wise, like the practical sets, the wardrobe, the hair. Oh my God. The production design. All of that was great. I just, I think the way that it encourages you to, like, to not think about it on a big scale, but only think about, like, the only place to apply, like, deeper thinking is when it comes to Barbie's experience. It just, it's just very white feminism to me. I think the reason why it feels so uncomfortable to critique it so hard is that it's, like, a huge we, accomplishment. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, we don't want to shit on things that are made for the girls. But, like, to blindly support it and not critique it is to, like, talk down to it almost. Yeah, because I or respect like, the people behind this so much. Yeah, I think that yeah. all of this is extremely fair game to talk about. And in this in the current state of things... This is the toughest thing. We've talked about it before. We have to find ways to tell our story in a way that feels authentic while still being profitable to a system that still doesn't fuck with us that much. (laughs) So that's a really, really hard battle to fight. So the fact that, you know, this exists at all is a win for sure. Produced by a huge corporation that has traditionally strayed away from anything even you know they want to be on the right side of history clearly at this point they have made that decision um but it's it's their version of the right side of history which is not that great but it's better i guess yeah. than nothing yeah with this book that i read like how tight of a leash they've had on the barbie brand for so long like to loosen it a bit and let there be any level of play or like satire with it that they're supporting yeah is it's a, huge... a really big step in the right direction yeah i'm really happy for the economic success of it and i hope that it spawns opportunities similar big budget opportunities for other female yeah lgbtq non-white yeah. directors this wig is hot i'll tell you that much <laughs> i'm sweating i think I think that I'm really, really interested to hear people's thoughts on this movie, especially based off this conversation that we've had, because, again, everyone hesitates to be critical of it, especially the girls, because you don't want to tear down. No, and it's like, how insidious is that? I mean, if you want to think about it that way, like, yeah, we all have to support it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. If you're not in our Discord yet, you should join it because we will be talking about this in the Discord, I'm sure. And if you have an opinion you want to share, like, we we will all be 
talking about it i'm i'm certain Mm -hmm. but now that we've talked about it i feel way more liberated to talk with other people about it yeah me too i was holding in i literally wasn't responding to anybody asking about it because i was like i can't i don't want to i know use my thoughts (laughs) yet I know shout out to poor chris of gbf fame we were texting about it because he had i think he had posted something online being yeah. like i'm disappointed oh it was in our group chat and i texted him separately and he gave me his opinion and neither of us responded because we were trying to not say anything and then he responded and was like please tell me if i'm being problematic <laughs> and i was like no gaga like we just are trying to not say anything yeah so now we can now unleash. we can let the floodgates go i'm very glad this movie exists summer fun for everyone i see the intentions some beautiful filmmaking and there's a lot going on here and i would love to hear from you guys on this one yeah because maybe we're naming the elephants in the room that you haven't been able to place yeah, like, did did you feel... Ki- I mean, I feel like if you listen to this podcast a lot, you clearly feel similar things. You would have similar feelings and notice similar things watching this movie. Well, on that note, this was the fastest feeling recording I think we've ever done. Yeah, there was a lot to say. And again, we want to hear from you on this. And yeah, if you haven't seen Barbie yet, get your little Regal Unlimited membership in place and... Go yeah. to the nearest Regal, get some popcorn. I still stand Greta Gerwig. It's nothing personal. And that's my last. It's just drag. Yeah. Let her get her money and let her direct more. And that's what I that's what I want. As always, you can find more from us at evergreenpodcast.com slash sleepover dash cinema and keep up with our latest creative projects at twopingproductions.com. We're on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube at Sleepover Cinema and post a full video version of each episode on YouTube every Thursday. You can follow me, Audrey, at Audrey Anna Leach on everything. And you can follow me, Hannah, at Hannah Ray Leach on everything. And again, join our Discord server if you want to get in on this riveting convo i'm sure we are about to have it is at the link in the episode description or on evergreenpodcasts.com you can check out our merch at twopinkproductions.com slash shop you know what it is pink now that i think about it it's extremely it's pink very pink so yeah you could get sleepover cinema merch and then wear it to barbie and if you like the show and if we were like saying the things you've been scared to say or think please share this episode with your circle again i'm interested in hearing the discourse around this one so share it with a friend sleepover cinema is a production of evergreen podcasts produced edited and engineered by us hannah and audrey leach sleepover cinema is mixed by sean roll hoffman with theme music by josh perlman hall executive producer is michael dealoya be who you wanna be barbie girl (laughs)